Many writers in their youth write poetry. I, instead of poetry, wrote the palm of the hand stories. Among them are unreasonably fabricated pieces, but there are more than a few good ones that flowed from my pen naturally of their own accord. The poetic spirit of my young days lives on in them. Hi, this is Nathan. Hey, this is Nick. And I am David. And welcome to another episode of The Boss Podcast. On today's episode, we are gearing up for the book club selection of Yasunari Kawabata's The Sound of the Mountain, looking at a handful of stories from his Palm of the Hand Stories collection. The four stories we will discuss today are A Sunny Place, Sleeping Habit, The Silver Fifty Cent Pieces, and Immortality. All right, so before we uh, start talking about these stories, I'm going to ask you, Nathan, since you gave us that quote from Kawabata at the beginning, maybe a little bit about what he meant by the phrase palm of the hand to describe these vignettes that we're reading. Well, these um, these vignettes are, are very short stories, sometimes less than a page. Um, I think the longest one that we read, with the exception of maybe Snow Country, four pages. I mean, they exist somewhere kind of between a short story and uh, a poem. They're just these these very astute observations of life. Uh, I was just going to make note that that Kawabata, even though the quote is more focused on the youth, it's something that he did from the very beginning of his career up until the, until he died. I, I I thought that was interesting too in the quote. I mean, do you think that he means that? I mean, in, in the collection. So the collection. I don't know how many there are in here, but it's um two hundred over two hundred pages of these. They seem to be very heavily. F- loaded in his earlier days there's a lot written in the 20s there's less written in 30s and fewer in the 40s and you know on so do you think that he saw it as a practice of his early career it certainly seems that way but i think it's that the line that it's the spirit of his younger self who maybe identified more with the poetic spirit or the reductionist mentality of what he was trying to do with these stories that maybe carried through into his older his older writings or his writings when he was an older man. Yeah, and I think even when he when he got into his his longer novels, they're they're still sort of following that that sparse reduction type of style anyway. So yeah, I think these were very much like a, a stepping stone to get into that. And you know, even when you get into Snow Country, which is I think we, you know, we had talked about what 100, 120 pages. You know, it's still focusing on these observations and these vignettes and these these quiet moments. And so, yeah, I think while he started with a lot of these in like the early 20s um, and sort of tapered off in, in writing fewer of them as, as he got older, I think that style was still very much like the backbone of a lot of his writing. So do you see these as almost style exercises that maybe he needed more of as a young writer early in his career, but that developed into you know, reductionist but longer form writings later on in his career? Yeah, I think that's exactly how I interpret these. Um, you know, they seem, you know, we'll go through these stories and they seem like he's got a goal in mind for each one and something that he's experimenting with or playing with. And uh, I think they all tie together in uh, a lot of the tone. But but between some of those things that he's trying to accomplish in a page or two, I think uh, I think they very much are sort of form exercises. You know, with that, we can kind of we can kind of start in the first one. So Sunny Place. So this is a story in which uh, a young man falls in love with a young woman and he finds himself staring at her face for long periods of time. And as he realizes that, he he digs into his memory to try and figure out where that habit comes from. And he finds that it comes from uh, a period in which he lived with his blind grandfather. So this, to me, uh, my interpretation is sort of tracking your interactions with other humans through the familiar path of memory. So, uh, David, you know, what, what did you really get out of this first story? Well, I think you, you, you captured one main thing that is throughout all of these stories, and that's this, this concern with memory. And I, I think the reason we chose this story, which happens to be the first one in the collection, is it's such a distillation of that primary concern. And what I saw was a second main concern of Kawabata's work, which is trying to capture just these single moments in a person's life and trying to understand what the significance of that moment is in the present tense, but also using that moment to better understand something that happened in the past tense. Almost like right now in this moment, I'm feeling this thing. I'm, I'm trying to understand it. 
why is this feeling coming from? And then they sort of, these characters, these narrators, retrace it back to something that happened to them in the past to better understand where they are in the present. And it all happens in like two, two and a half pages. And a matter of a few seconds, if you look at the story chronologically. Yeah, that's it's, true. It's kind, of, it's kind of literally a moment. And I think that capturing of a moment is why these stories are often compared in, in scholarly writing and even in the introduction as very much like haiku, which is these, this small moment or these sometimes disparate elements put side by side to capture a sort of inexplicable feeling. Right, and he goes through the depth of time that happens in that moment, which I think is pretty cool. So he, he looks back to, I believe, the main character. Uh, his parents had died, and then so he moved on to live with his, his grandfather, and then his grandfather died, and now he's in this moment where he's falling in love with, uh, with this young woman. And then she even makes the comment um, that, uh, you know, my face will become less and less novel with each day and night, so I'm not worried. So she's even tracking it far into the future. So he really covers in this sort of split second story uh internal sort of uh, you know monologue discussion he covers my estimate you know decades and so i think that's really impressive to tie that together in such a clean kind of like stark style and i think just kind of formally this ties back to the idea of a haiku also and, and i was probably what i enjoyed the most about these stories is how through the majority of the story, it's it's kind of slow or, or very little is happening. And then an observation at the end kind of gives you a different interpretation of what you just read or, or fills in a lot or allows you to fill in a lot. And I think, Nick, the line that you just read does that in this story. Yeah, he's very much a, a master of the subtle shift that he, that he slips in there. And it's interesting because across the stories, sometimes I feel like he's playing with how subtle that really is. You know, some of them, he, he throws it in there as, as a very discernible shift. And this one, I, I felt like uh, it was more of a, a lower, on the, lower on the radar. It was kind of, you know, tracking it with, with the projection into the future and growing old. And it's interesting that he wrote this when he was also 24 and the characters are 24. And already he's talking about aging. I think that fits in with me, kind of what I think Kawabata often uh often emanates which is which is aging and sort of uh this this quiet quest that we're on throughout our lives and uh you know so i just like that he was doing that even as a, a very young man himself um i wanted to to add a thought kind of coming off of nick what you were just saying about this is a very subtle shift in tone at the end it's almost a rhythmic shift but what what it does for me is it indicates that there's sort of a parallel story going on because the majority of these two, three pages is this sort of inner conversation that this kid's having with himself about why am I staring at this girl? But what she says when she says, my face will become less and less novel with each day and night, she's having a different inner monologue that's running parallel to his. Well, in her mind, she's saying, I don't mind that you look at me because this is going to go away at some point. Yeah, but she's probably spiraling in her own directions of time, right? But yeah, she's not responding to his inner monologue. I think we read it and think like, oh, she's responding to what he's saying. But actually, no, she's thinking about a different set of things. So, so it's almost like we kind of boiled this, this beautiful, very quiet story down into time travel that we just did. <laughs> That's right. That memory is the truest form of time travel. That, yeah, okay, nailed it. All right, so <laughs> let's move on to the next one. So uh, Sleeping Habit. Nathan, do you want to give us a, a quick summary of what that one was? So Sleeping Habit was written in 1932, nine years after A Sunny Place. And we have... Um, two lovers in bed having an argument about how much they should touch while they're sleeping. <laughs> okay. Yeah, man, this one's a, this one, this is a tough one to sort of jump into. and It, it is because it's so ridiculous. I mean, the argument that they're having is ridiculous. Well, I, th I think the concern and what, what the story in my mind is, is at least seemingly trying to do is figure out how do people in a relationship who have different opinions about how they coexist come to form a habit of coexistence you know throughout the super short story there's all this negative associated with their sleeping and not sleeping sexually but just sleeping side by side together the woman's hair it opens with a sense of pain as her hair sort of wraps around this man and at first in the relationships they're not together every night there's certain nights where it's okay is how it's phrased for her to stay with him 
although that is never really sussed out. You don't have any idea what makes something okay or not okay, because you don't know anything. It's just he and she and this conflict over how much time they spend together at night till it finally gets to the end and it, you get to the title of the story when, where it just becomes this habit. Yeah, like I think it's... I think it shows her trying to do these steps to pull them together somewhat, um, you know, kind of in an overriding sense. Like if I do these things, if I if I wrap the sleeve of my kimono around you and hold you close, and if I if I wrap if I wrap my hair around your neck, I'll hold you close. And that pulling and tugging uh, eventually ends up in the subtle shift that we had talked about, where even though they end up sleeping apart, there is a small part of them, an arm that you know remains touching. So it's kind of like the struggle of coming together in a relationship, but the reality is is it's never as aggressive, it's never as um, full-on intense as it kind of is in those early maybe quarreling days, um, but every way sort of meets in the middle, and it's it's almost like you need, you need the aspect of time to allow that to happen to kind of distill it down to what that meeting yeah. point is. I, I think there's also a way to read this as somewhat misogynistic and gendered is because it's the woman who's constantly trying to get this man to sleep next to her and for them to touch and she sort of slowly like you said wraps herself around him until he eventually gives up and finds comfort in that it's very strange the way that he is sort of represented as is that he's resistant to her at first he has lines about the idea of sleeping selfish and he kind of ridicules the way that she talks about her hair and that relationship to her hair and the sleeping patterns that they have until eventually by the end of the story, he seems to want what she wanted all along. Right. Well, I mean, it is, it is gendered in that there's a male and a female, but I, I don't think that anything would be lost in the story if the roles were reversed and it, it was, it was him that was reaching and her that was resisting. I think, I think that these, these two energies, whatever they are, the, the active and the passive energy, um, that what's important is at the at the end, the line. Um, but if she happened to wake up, her arm was always touching him, and his arm was touching her, so that when they ceased struggling, they naturally reached out for each other. Right. He kind of uses yeah he uses sleep initially as selfish, and it has that that very short quote about how there's nothing so selfish as sleep, and then eventually, uh, as the story progresses. They, they find a way to not be selfish within sleeping. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to, to just touch on something that um, I think, David, you had made a note of, that, that this is, it's fairly am- ambiguous about whether or not it ends positively or negatively. Um, the line, as time went by, they forgot about that sort of thing. These nights, she slept as if she'd forgotten he was there. How do each of you interpret that? It's almost as if... I think there's many ways to read it, and there's many ways to read a lot of these stories, but you can read it a couple ways. One, like, as in the story, there's clearly, there's lines, he believes this, she does this, he is this, and at the end it's they, so that it's almost the way um, Joseph Campbell talks about what a marriage is, is this union where the I no longer really has a place and it becomes the we kind of thing. I mean, if you want to read it into it, that positive sort of light that she no longer can distinguish that much. But then I think that falls apart when you start talking about the touching of the two people as if they're still trying to connect. And I think that's what makes the story so difficult to to figure out exactly is because, at least in my mind, I don't really know what it's trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of a, a slow coming together, but you can you can read it both ways as as they're coming together because they're sort of they're sort of giving up the fight or they're coming together because they want to come together or they're coming together out of habit they just give up it's like well we're together yeah exactly this is what it is and i I think i've read this story probably five times because it is conveniently like a page long uh so i can't i I convince myself different different times it's different ways yeah um okay so moving on to to the next one so silver 50 cent pieces uh, so this is the longest one of the selections we've picked out. I think it's six or seven pages. And so in this story, we have a very young, thrifty girl who uh, is deliberating over a, a a cheap paperweight. And through that process, she sort of gives it value. And then in the second episode of the story, she and her mother are on a shopping trip, and, and her mother is deliberating over buying a, a very cheap umbrella. And then the story at the end uh, quickly fast forwards seven years after the war, 
and uh, you're in Tokyo post firebombing. There's lots of inflation, and uh, she finds that she still has the paperweight, and that's sort of the attachment from uh, the past to uh, to the present. And so, you know, Nathan, how did what did you get out of this story? Well, I think it's important to note what every person in 1946 and certainly every Japanese person in 1946 would know is that in 1939 which is when the story starts is immediately before the escalation of of the Japanese Pacific War and 1945 when the when the story ends or 1946 when the story ends um, was immediately after the war ended so it's very it's not just before and after but it's immediately before and after World War II or the Japanese World War II. Yeah that's an important that's an important historical perspective. And I think one of the reasons why we ended up looking to read this is because of that component. And a lot of a lot of Kawabata's longer fiction sort of takes place nearer to uh, the time of the war, uh, you know, the period up to it and then the period after it. And so I think having a story that exactly straddles that uh, captures uh, something that very much influenced Kawabata uh, both thematically and uh, and emotionally. And I was just, I was going to add um, the sort of post-war changes that happened to Japan influenced a lot of the art that was happening. And this this reflection back to a time before this influx of Western influence. And I, I think that the story very pointedly highlights that in, in this, this, the frugality of this girl who really valued this paperweight, who placed so much value on this paperweight that was objectively worth nothing. And then in the end... She's comparing herself to uh, girls nowadays who I presume are, are making a thousand yen a night, and I presume by prostitution, but they don't. She, he doesn't make that explicit, I don't think. And the difference in, in valuation. I don't know what the difference is between uh, a fifty cent piece and a thousand yen. Uh, we should look that up. Does anybody know what the difference is between fifty cent and a thousand yen? I actually did this math. Yeah, it's you. We got it here. One yen equals one hundred sen, and she received two hundred sen a month. And this, but this was before the war, so we don't really know. Yeah, there, there's no. Re- but the idea, I think, behind knowing that is is important because you see her sort of wrestle with whether or not she wants to spend such a small amount of money on this tiny little object that. It's never really explained. There's there's a line that just says its thrilling coolness, its unexpected weightiness suddenly gave her pleasure. And she sort of finds some pleasure in this little object, but it's not until later after the war till it becomes laden with importance and significance to her. It's sort of this a lot of the stories this way for her to go back into her past and remember something from that. I think it's never explicit what it means to her exactly, but she she finds comfort in knowing that she still owns this object and that she is connected to it in some way. And to me, the the statement that's being made is, is about values and that she can take this thing that's inherently worthless and value it so much. And she evaluated it, valued it immediately after she bought it, and she values it even more later on. But the extrinsic value of it hasn't changed. It's still, you know, a little trinket. Yeah. I think that that theme that shows up in a lot of uh, Kawabata's other writings is, like you mentioned, the you know the influx of, of Western influence, and this is right on the edge of consumerism, and all of this stuff is is just about to take off, and and I I've always felt like Kawabata as a writer sort of wanted the wanted the simplicity. Um, I don't know politically where he stood. Um, I think it was more so on the conservative side, but he wanted that, you know, ability to attach importance to things, um, not because they had a high value from a monetary sense, but because they had a high value to yourself. And so when he tracks uh, this girl into being a woman through through these multiple episodes, um, he's very he's very poetically and and very um, very emotionally sort of tying that back to. Uh, you know, it's up to us to attach value to things, and um, you know, if we just if we just attach the value that society gives it via you know the money system and consumerism, then you know we're we're not really in control of anything. Yeah, I agree. And I, one of the things that I really appreciate about this story and his stories in in general, are how he can make a point like that so quietly and so subtly. You know, th- there's not a you can sense this 
this sort of judgment at the end about these girls making a thousand yen a night and what the value is in that. But it's not it's not explicit. It's not loud. Right. It's almost like he's allowing room for for the main character to find the positivity in her own relation to it. It's not really looking down upon these these other girls or looking down upon the reality, but more so sort of a longing for, you know, something that had value to yourself. Yeah. Okay, so if we want to move on to the fourth story, so David, if you want to give us a, a quick summary of, of Immortality. Yeah, so the last story that we're going to discuss is Immortality. The, the publication or written date that's given is 1963. Like some of the stories in the collection, this is the one that we are discussing that deals with fantastical elements. The, the basic premise is there's an old man and a young girl walking together through a sort of field or a park near a uh, driving range or a golf course, I believe. And they're, they're sitting there, they're talking sort of past each other, and you realize that at first that the young girl committed suicide at some point, and these two used to be lovers, and they're discussing the possibility of what's going to happen after the old man is dead. And then in the very last scene, the young girl decides to walk through a tree, and the old man follows her and walks through a tree, and they realize that they're actually both dead and having this conversation, and then they decide to enter into the tree and just apparently live happily ever after. We have no idea. But but generally, <laughs> you know, I think the idea behind this the story, at least as I read it, was again this, this, this concern with memory, and here you see the old man sort of living for the memory of this girl until he eventually dies. You don't know how he dies or when he dies, but you see this sort of power of of love through death, and you start to get an idea of, of what maybe Kawabata, the, the sort of romantic side of him, is really what comes out in the story more than anything. Yeah, and it's it's romantic, but it's also it's also funny. I mean, it's a little it bit is, supernatural. Yeah. Uh, you know, the guy's the guy's living hell was working at a golf course for seventeen years. I don't know about you, but I feel like Kawabata just fucking hates the idea of golf. <laughs> like you guys are gonna just hit this stupid ball around we got way more important shit to do yeah i think the key there is because it destroys the natural environment and that bothered him a lot yeah exactly and then like you track it through like it's 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 a ghost story right this is like a romantic supernatural ghost love story and yeah. if you would have like asked me before like i read this collection of short stories if i thought kawabata was ever gonna write something like that i would have been like i doubt it but he yeah. does it, and he does it, you know, he does it very elegantly, but also humorously. And uh, I think that's, like, really what stands out about this. I think there's a fair amount of ambiguity about it, too, that I really appreciate. Because there's moments where, for instance, he can't hear her because he's deaf, and he just kind of mumbles to himself. And you think, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's a an, an analogy that she's not actually a ghost walking with him. It's It's his memory that's walking with him, and he's talking to his memory. Or if he's actually dead, as, you, as it appears in the end, and he's been a ghost this whole time, why is he, why is he old? Why can't he hear? Um, why does he stumble into the net at the beginning? There's kind of, it, it seemed to me that it, it doesn't really commit itself to being any one of those things. Yeah, I, I think it's it's playful in that way. But I also like if I when I because I've read all the stories we're discussing multiple times, I kind of tried to figure out why that would be and. I think because the girl is young and he is old, I'm assuming in this version of whatever an afterlife is, the body you died in at the moment it died is the body you sort of maintain into the spiritual world. She's still young. She's still the same age she was when she committed suicide and drowned in the ocean, I believe, which is why he's working at the golf course, because he wants to be near where she was. So do you, you, you read it pretty literally as a, uh, as a ghost story? Yeah, I do. I I read it as a ghost. Or I read it. I read it as he he must have died as an old man in his sleep or something, not aware that he's dead. And for whatever reason, they're now having this conversation, and they're concerned about. I, I think that's what also is, makes it funny is they're concerned about what their relationship is going to be like once he finally dies, and they're having that conversation after he's already dead. It's, it's playful, I guess. Is is kind of how I see this story. It's a playful ghost story. Playful ghost love story. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Nailed that one too. Um, okay. So like if we were to like pull this all back and like look at the connection in between these, because, you know, they're written over a period of 40 years. 
uh, you know, they're all on wildly different topics from sort of uh, very short observations of an exact moment in time to tying things uh, across World War II into supernatural uh, ghost romance. You know, like, what do you, what do you guys think that Kawabata really accomplished with what sort of seems like an early uh, uh, rubric for extremely, extremely short fiction? I think you kind of touched on it. It's this ability and the importance of focusing in on a very small moment in life and trying to distill importance from it and how that connects to your past, your present, and whatever possible future you hope to have. And that there is importance in those in those little moments. I agree with that. And I, I would I would add that this there's a strong sense of uh, of this inner life, and that these moments expand because these characters explore their their inner worlds. And in Kalabata's case, these tend to be nostalgic worlds, um, memories of previous times. They spend a lot of time looking back on things. Yeah, and I do I do get the sense of nostalgia being important to Kalabata. Uh, but not in the way I feel like right now, uh, just the current generation where we're at, there's this whole discussion of nostalgia and, you know, is it, is it a detriment? Do we, do we spend too much time on nostalgia? Uh, you know, should we be looking at the present? Should we be looking at the future? Um, but I think with Kawabata, it's, it's like nostalgia in moderation. You know, he's, he appreciates simplicity. He appreciates those, those inner worlds, but I think also the, the connection between everyone's inner worlds, you know, it's like a, it's like a big fabric and um, so I think he shows us how we can appreciate these things that have happened to us and these occurrences, um, but also bring that importance back to the present. And like, I think that's the main thing that I get out of, uh, you know, reading these, these very short uh, explorations in fiction. So here's a question. Did you, did you guys like it at the end of the day? Yeah, I, I, I liked it quite a bit, mostly because my first introduction to Kawabata was the novel Snow Country, and I read a little bit about him and People generally consider him a traditionalist and somewhat conservative, both politically and as a writer, in terms of what he does or is trying to do. And so I, I was a bit hesitant about going into it. And I found that these stories in particular seem to sort of challenge that idea because they are, you know, not only experimental in form, and some of them are rather experimental in, in terms of getting to psychology of characters and how the story is revealed to the reader and things like that. So I was pleasantly surprised with the collection of, of stories, actually. I, I like them a lot. I like the, the way that he focuses on the moments, the subtle the subtleness of the stories. It's just, it's very, I found reading them to be very soothing. I have some difficulty with the shortness of, or the brevity of them, just because there's, <laughs> I feel this way about most collections of short stories. It's hard to get any sort of rhythm going in it i find so i just personally i don't have a strong desire to pick it up and read the next one yeah i would say for anyone that hasn't read them it's not they weren't intended to be read straight through and it's difficult to do that you need to take a break and i think sort of savor them and read them over again the way you would a poem yeah i agree with that and i think i got more out of them as i read more or sorry as i read them over and over um, but for me, I think, I think I'm actually a little bit in between, you know, uh, every time we talk about these, these stories or, or, you know, writing in general, I, I end up at the end of the day, just loving it. But, um, I think for this stuff, I had read some other works by Kawabata, you know, Snow Country, Thousand Cranes, Master Go. I actually just like those a lot more. And I think, um, I think the experimental aspect of these stories, I'm very much into, but in terms of uh, just sort of an emotional connection, I find myself being way more invested in uh, those other works that he's he's very well known for. Um, you know, it's not to be said not to not to say that I didn't like these. I just didn't find myself as drawn in, and part of that is the rhythm, you know, that we just mentioned. But I think um, I think Kawabata, in addition to observing the quiet moments, can really really drill down into the details and the impact of that. And that, to me, is what shows up in his longer fiction. And I think that's what I've kind of come to really like about Kawabata. Yeah, I, I think we see that a lot in Snow Country and in the book we're going to be discussing soon, The Sound of the Mountain. Yeah, definitely really excited for that one, especially since you know I think it thematically ties in with sort of aging and um, you know progression of time and, and reflection. 
and like all of those seem very much in the wheelhouse of, of what I expect and want out of Kawabata. And so super excited to start reading that one. Thanks for listening, everybody. Join us for the next episode as we look at Kaobata's novel, The Sound of the Mountain. Keep up to date with everything going on with Boss. Check us out online at www.booksofsomesubstance.com. Follow us on Twitter at Books O Substance. And now we're on Facebook. Uh, whatever the Facebook thing is called, it's Books of Some Substance. Search it. You know how to use Facebook. If you don't, ask your mom. So through each of those avenues, you can join Boss, which is a growing community of people. And then you'll be able to get cool artwork in the mail that Nathan designs and a typewritten letter for why we're picking each selection and why it's going to be cool to read it. So make sure you check us out online, sign up, and then uh, we'll see you for the next book. (laughs) Yeah, just fucking delete the whole thing. I just threw my computer out the window. Put a bow on it. Um, sorry. I did not have a thought after that.